All right. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction and the invitation to be in conversation with you all. We're really looking forward to the opportunity um, for the question and answer period and, and just really the chance to talk with you all. Um, as mentioned, my name is Jenny Davis, um, and usually we uh, practice that we have here um, uh, kind of not across the US, but in various places within it is to begin our conversations with a land acknowledgement statement. Um, and that's that's how we would like to begin today. Um, so our talk is called Data is Not Neutral, Gender and Generalizability in Research Methodology. And we would like to begin by recognizing and acknowledging that we are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Adwa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. These lands are the ter traditional territories of these native nations prior to our forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and our struggles for survival and identity. We acknowledge these nations and others past and present with gratitude to the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout generations. We also acknowledge native people who live and work here now. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois has a particular responsibility to acknowledge the peoples of these lands, as well as the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution for the past 150 years. We are also obligated to reflect on and actively address these histories and the har often harmful role that this university has played in shaping them. And we feel this acknowledgement is especially important in light of the ways that current practices of science were created out of and replicate colonialist values. Next slide. Okay. Um, so the, the collaborations between uh, Dr. Clancy and myself uh, began with a, 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 a conversation that ended up in an article um, called, uh, titled, um, Soylent is People and Weird is White, Biological Anthropology, Whiteness, and the Limits of the Weird. Um, and in this paper, we were uh, interested in this acronym for WEIRD, which stands for Western Educated Industrialized Rich and Democratic. Um, and this uh, acronym exists as a kind of, uh, originally as a way of critiquing some of the ways that um, only small portions of populations were being included and as the basis for a number of research within the social sciences and um, lab sciences. Um, but we wanted to have a, um, an opportunity to delve into uh, thinking about exactly what the critique was, um, thinking about which ways, um, how we could better uh, operationalize and interrogate uh, the things that were both uh, assumed within that acronym and the individual pieces of it, and also what might be erased from the concept itself and the ways that it was being circulated. So, I think. so in general, WEIRD uh, is used as a kind of catch-all term um, that, uh, again, refers to a number of things um, that could could use or we felt could use unpacking. Um, so things like Western, right? What, it, what is included in Western, what is assumed within that framework, um, especially when considering that entire uh, hemispheres, right, of, um, of geography, but not entire hemispheres of people were being represented by a term just like weird or just like educated. And that in all of the contexts that are being discussed, industrialized, rich, and democratic, there were whole groups of folks who were not in fact uh, being included within this research, not in fact being seen within um, the studies that nonetheless um, were uh, claiming them geographically, but not demographically, right? Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to really focus on too was the W, um, not as Western, but in fact as white, and um, really calling out the fact that the unnamed but a assumed organizational thing that bound uh, the folks within this acronym and within these research studies was in fact whiteness. Um, so Western then stands in for whiteness. And in fact, the ways that um, having this acronym be a un, um, unacknowledged way of saying white, um, in fact, defined folks who weren't white outside of the other aspects of these characteristics. So. Um, we really wanted to really call out whiteness as a, a, a concept and a reality 
that uh, research, especially within um, anthropology and the biological sciences and psychological sciences should be naming and thinking about both from the perspective of who is conducting research, how is research being circulated and who are the folks who are the subjects and focus of the study and then who are the beneficiaries and recipients of that research. Um, and so uh, we wanted to think about, right, the, again, the ways that um, populations were being in some ways uh, included but not represented, right, um, and overlooked, often erased uh, by the ways that weird was circulating and operationalized, even when it was being used as a critique, right? So raised as something that lets us really identify that there are limits to research that's being done, um, but not, uh, not necessarily getting to all of the underlying factors. Um, so, you know, we were able to think about the ways that weird is a term that really uh, obscures and collapses difference. It, um, in fact, is avoiding the conversation of race and racism. Um, and it, in doing so, is also uh, creating a, a paradigm where you have to create and, and operate under the model of comparison um, in order to move outside of weirdness rather than unpacking the ways that it, weirdness itself operates. Um, and so one of the things that we thought about in that process was also what are the modes for working outside of it, right? How do we, um, how do we both critique the kinds of practices that the acronym was meant to critique um, and also move beyond some of the things that might be built in even in that critique. Um, so how do we question things like normality and replicability and generalizability? How do we integrate practices of reflexivity and collaborative work in order to do it? Um, and so that really was a, a building block, I think, and the kind of first step that led to today's talk and the, and the continued collaboration between Dr. Clancy and myself, um, where while we're thinking about weird and thinking about these concepts of normality and replicability, generalizability, erasure, right, markedness and unmarkedness, um, we uh, are kind of continuing that conversation to think about gender. Um, so in the concept of why gender, um, we have, uh, there are a lot of ways that gender operates within our research, within the research um, across lots of fields and particularly within um, the scientific fields that we are talking about. Um, so gender is a cultural concept that categorizes people, right? Um, so it uses a number of different um, kinds of criteria and ways of grouping people. And there are a number of um, uh, phenomenological things that are assumed within something like gender that may be gender, sex, or gender sex. Um, and again, one of the things that happens because it's a cultural concept and grouping is that the parameters for uh, defining gender and also what's assumed to be packaged within gender are rarely laid out very clearly uh, by the folks who are using that term to organize their research. And instead, um, it's assumed that we all mean the same thing when we use gender categories. So I think next. Um, the other key piece that we wanted to, um, that's center to the way we think about gender is the fact that gender is always a racializing concept. So there is no uh, concept of gender that isn't always and already um, in, embroiled and, and packaged within the concepts, the also cultural concepts of race, um, so that uh, race and racism are occurring within gendered parameters and, and gender as a concept is existing always in, within a kind of global racial, racializing um, ideologies. And uh, one of the things that we will say probably more than once today is that when we're thinking about gender and thinking about ways to, uh, again, critique and identify the ways that it operates, um, problematically within our research, it's not a call to, um, to, to throw gender out in the sense that we recognize that the way that it operates and can be operationalized um, bears, bears reevaluating, bears being quite critical of, um, but not 
that it is never irrelevant or not important to the ways that people experience the world and the ways that um, the world is uh, impacts people's lives along gendered lines. So um, this is, you know, a way to recognize that um, the ways that gender operates can be both a, a problem and things that are diminishing um, research and the ways that people experience the world, and yet it may be significant um, to people themselves and to the way people um, enact in the world. Um, so this leads and is connected to uh, gender inequality, right? So ways of thinking about the pervasive problems um, across the sciences um, in how gender affects who gets to be trained in science, who is able to reproduce science um, and participate in science, who is the research um, in ways that are robust and beneficial to the uh, community, who is not researched in ways that are harmful and exclusionary to the community. Um, so thinking about who benefits or is harmed by research and who sets the norms and values. So again, we're trying to um, uh, a kind of balancing line for thinking about gender as a, a critical component of research, um, but not in a way that erases the um, kind of cultural concepts and the ways that it operates as a category. And I'll hand it over to Kate. Um, as anthropologists, many of us pay attention to lived experience. Um, we especially try to hold our own, withhold our own judgment or expert opinion on a topic until we've spent a lot of time listening. We endeavor to perform what anthropologist Anna Singh calls the art of noticing. Um, Singh uses the metaphor of polyphonic music, multiple independent melodies played together to help us understand that in order to do the work of noticing, we have to be willing to step back from the idea that there is one dominant melody and instead listen for the moments of harmony and dissonance they created together. In her book Against Purity, Living Ethically in Compromised Times, uh, philosopher Alexis Shotwell steps into this conversation on noticing and adds that to notice the world is a practice of responsibility. Noticing allows us to see power, to follow multiple threads without allowing one to dominate, and to my mind is a really essential scientific practice. Um, noticing as an act of responsibility pairs really well with feminist science. Feminist methods are intersectional, taking on issues of power not only regarding uh, gender, but gender identity, sexual identity, race, ethnicity, class, geography, and more. Um, and feminist methods are not just about developing, you know, some sense of girl power, but inquiring deeply into the practices and processes of science and medicine. So the four main components typically of feminist methods in science and medicine are to inquire about our history, so to understand, you know, to trace back an idea, uh, as well as the culture of during the time when different ideas were developed, to test the assumptions in the literature, to think globally, and so again, to expand our definition of who is important to study, who is important to think about, um, and, you know, really embrace a, a better understanding of variability, and to develop reflexive practices. The plan for today's talk is that we're going to sort of use that framework um, to think about three problems that uh, Dr. Davis and I have identified with modern scientific methodology, values, and incentive structures. Um, the three that we're going to be sort of providing some examples of today are average is not normal, is not ideal. So thinking about how these three terms so often get conflated with each other, um, again, in the same way that Dr. Davis talked about, we use this term gender, we don't always mean this, you know, we don't always bother defining what it means, and so we aren't always clear on what it means. Um, I think that's often is the case also with these terms as well. Um, categories and binaries, obviously, in particular, as they influence gender is another thing we're going to be talking about. And then generalizable for who. So, um, you know, uh, one of the key factors often, at least in American funding agencies, is they often ask, is your research generalizable to the broader population? Does it support um, or enhance the health or tell us things about everybody? Um, and, you know, we, we want to challenge whether that's a useful goal and sort of problematize how it shows up in the scientific literature. Um, and then as a way to sort of counter or address that, we're going to offer some solutions that I hope will expand and enrich our understanding of science. Specifically, we're going to offer several 
queer feminist interventions, and then a couple of examples of how we see it already showing up, ways in which we can disrupt some of the current incentive structures of science and um, and uh, see what we can, you know, see what we can do to unpack some of these problems. Okay, so the the first so um, and just to give you all sort of a roadmap for the talk, I'm now going to go through these three problems and provide examples, and then Dr. Davis is going to offer the interventions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give this part of the talk. So the first of the three problems, average is not normal, is not ideal. Um, you can see this showing up in a lot of different ways. And again, like I said, when it comes to feminist methods, I think it's often really important to pay attention to history. So that's where we're going to start. Once upon a time, <clears throat> the concept of normal meant functional, meaning it was used to define how parts of the body worked. Your kidneys were normal, meaning they functioned as intended, or they were not. Increasingly, as medicine in particular began its broad standardization project, there came to be expectations about what it meant to be normal in terms of who fell within a normal distribution. Now, normal often means average or within one standard deviation of average or in the normal range. You may have received blood work at the doctor and to contextualize your own numbers, they are often shown alongside a normal range. This conflation of normal and average was also part of the broader eugenic project, which was to classify certain types of people as normal and others as abnormal. Those who are abnormal are unfit, unworthy of care. Those who are normal are healthy. However, the way that we tend to arrive at normal and average when it comes to the human body tends to be defined by what population we use to determine that average. <clears throat> A powerful example of that uh, begin, began in 1945. That year, the American Museum of Natural History revealed two new statues, Norma and Norman. These statues did not, however, seek to depict any specific persons. Instead, they were composites, meant to represent the statistically average American man and woman. A collaboration between gynecologist Dr. Robert L. Dickinson and sculptor Abram Belsky, the statues drew from a variety of sources a few million World War I soldiers, quote, special studies of the old American stock, college women and men, a sampling of attendees at the World's Fair in Chicago, insurance records, and a sample of 15,000 white women used by the Bureau of Home Economics to determine sizing standards for women's clothing. Norma reflected the norm for an 18 to 20-year-old American woman, where Norman was the norm for a 20-year-old man. These statues reaffirmed the ideal of the able-bodied, white, straight American and brought together the various paradoxes of what it meant to be normal in 20th century United States. Normal meant average, but not across all populations. Instead, normal was calculated across only a certain set of desirable populations, excluding people of color, queer people, disabled people, and anyone who might dare to occupy multiple of these identities. Note also that Norma's averages were derived from a younger population than Norman's, making them the perfect heteronormative couple. This is where we begin to see that normal and average are not the only concepts that tend to get conflated. Concepts of the ideal and of progress and evolution get mixed in too. Norma and Norman were expressly compared against North American indigenous people to quell white anxiety that the American environment would over time degrade good European stock. Dickinson, who pitched Norma as both the perfect woman and the average American, was influenced in his work by the eugenicist and anthropologist Ernest Houghton, who this audience likely knows advocated against aiding the poor and the reckless breeding of the unfit. American Museum of Natural History curator Harry Shapiro, also a eugenicist and anthropologist, these roles went hand in hand in the mid 20th century, wrote in a companion piece to these statues that, quote, the existence of a physical type distinctively American has for a long time been quite generally accepted both by Americans themselves as well as by foreigners. In this way, Norma and Norman were meant to represent typical white Americans, distinguishing them from the Europeans, particularly the English and the French. Shapiro, who would go on to become the president of the American Eugenic Society 10 years later, found the physical features of these American averages quite pleasing remarking that they, quote, leave little doubt that the figure is improving aesthetically, 
Norma especially captivated the public's interest, more so than Norman. When Norma and Norman were moved to the Cleveland Health Museum, the museum, along with the Academy of Medicine of Cleveland, the School of Medicine, and the Cleveland Board of Education sponsored a contest to find a woman who most closely matched Norma's dimensions. No such contest was created to find a living Norman. The Ohio woman who most closely matched Norma's dimensions would get a $100 war bond and earn the title of Norma Typical Woman. Martha Skidmore, a 23-year-old theater cashier, was the winner. Of the 3,864 contestants, only 40 hit the right dimensions on even five of the nine. Even Skidmore did not achieve normality on all nine dimensions. So another observation to make here is that the production of a normal average body by considering each dimension separately is to create a composite that does not exist in the real world. In his Natural History article, even Shapiro admits that, gorgeous as these forms are, they do not seem to represent many living people, noting, noting that averaging so many pro proportions renders the number of people who might fit all these categories at once to be extraordinary. Quote, let us state it this way, the average American figure approaches a kind of perfection of bodily form and proportion. The average is excessively rare. Unlike the classic figures of Greek sculpture, which were based on reality but then idealized, Shapiro argued Norma and Norman managed to be both ideal and represent the average of real Americans, rendering the American form more superior and evolved. Remember, this guy was a eugenicist. The average menstrual cycle, um, you know, as, as Henrika mentioned, uh, I do a lot of menstrual cycle and, and menstrual research, so I often draw my examples from this literature or from our own lab. And the average menstrual cycle is a great example of what happens when you try to build a norm out of, out of a lot of different data. Like Norma's nine dimensions, the hormones of the menstrual cycle have different, somewhat but not fully interrelated dimensions, from the estradiol peak to luteal progesterone to the luteal rise in estradiol that sometimes is related to the estradiol peak and sometimes to progesterone. The location of each of these points varies by person. So here's estrogen. I think you can see my cursor. Here's progesterone. Here also are, um, is the full range of variation from about 100 participants in my lab uh, of, Polish, of rural, rural Polish folks from the Benske Bispove mountain range, as well as Polish Americans from the Chicago and Champaign area. Um, so the location of each of these points also varies by person because not all menstrual cycles are the same length and the halves of the menstrual cycle are not halves. Those are variable as well. Um, and yet we average it all together. And this is the picture we show people to demonstrate and depict a normal menstrual cycle. Um, and so if normal re represents an ideal and averaging leads us to create a composite that in no way resembles a real person, the question is why we keep averaging these hormone values. I'll show you. So this is, um, this is again, examples from, this is a, an average of about 100 menstrual cycles from my lab. I'm going to show you just four menstrual cycles from this sample all of whom are Paris, meaning every participant I'm showing you a menstrual cycle of has had children, so therefore has you know, established fertility. And all of these are ovulatory menstrual cycles, meaning in every case, this person has evidence that they also ovulated. So this is what we should be calling a normal, healthy menstrual cycle. I mean, the top left kind of looks like the average, not really. And then look at all, you know, look at these other three, right? We're looking at three, uh, four demonstrably healthy, if that is something that we value, which, you know, again, we're not, I'm not necessarily contending um, healthism here, but I think we're, look, we're looking at people who have demonstrated fertility and their menstrual cycles and the hormones in their menstrual cycles don't actually look like the textbook at all. One other example from my lab is that there are times even that averaging something ends up representing exactly no one. So take the sample of rural Polish participants in my research. The eligibility criteria of our project requires that people be 20 to 40 years old, that they not be pregnant or breastfeeding or on hormonal contraception for at least six months, and that they have regular menstrual cycles. What that means is that the people who are eligible for our study are most likely to be at either end of our eligible age range because they either haven't started having children yet or they've finished. Most of the people in the middle are either contracepting, though don't tell their mothers-in-law, pregnant or breastfeeding. So you end up with a distribution of participants' years since first period, or menarche, that looks like this. The average 
is 19 and a half years, but there's no one in the sample who is 19, 20, 21, or 22 years since menarche. So this leads me, uh, this leads us to ask a couple of questions to kind of continue to think about these concepts that we don't always um, operationalize in our own research. So what is the purpose of ravaging values in this context? These are questions you can, and I should say, sorry, these are questions you can ask yourself in your own work. Which individuals or constituencies were involved in the creation of this average, which were left out? And what does it mean for an individual to be within or outside of the normal distribution? Is there biological meaning or just statistical meaning? The next section um, on categories and binaries, um, I wanted to start, there's just a, a, a book that I teach a lot in the fall semester because it's when I teach the first years in our graduate program. Um, and it's a book that came out in 2021, Dear Science and Other Stories by Dr. Catherine McKittrick. Um, and there's a quote I wanna provide from her that I really like, which is, discipline is the act of relentless categorization. Academic disciplines make knowledge into categories and subcategories. Methodology and method make discipline and knowledge about categories. So what I want us to consider for this section is the ways in which the act of studying categories is part of what can make categories real. This is especially interesting when it comes to how we define and understand gender, sex, and gender sex categories. Most Western science wants to categorize people into two sexes and compare them, usually to find difference. However, the majority of the research on sex differences that compares these two binaries has to alter the data or be unclear about the effect, the effect size of their data in order to contend that this effect exists. So I wanna provide one example here of, um, of, of, of work I really appreciate. Like Dr. Daphna Joel is a neuroscientist who has been really trying to make some major interventions in how we think about sex differences in neuroscience and in the brain. However, I want to point to what it is that she has to do in order to try to create, like, invent sex difference in her, in her data here. So she's offering up different models for how we think about sex differences. And you can see in these images, like if you just look at A, for instance, which is complete dimorphism, perfect internal consistency. So you look at a brain and every component of it is masculine or every component is feminine. And she took, she created an image of two normal distributions that would have overlapped, except that she used PowerPoint or Photoshop or something to white out the place where they would have overlapped, right? So she created a false dichotomy that doesn't even exist within how statistically we understand a normal dis distribution in order to create a false dichotomy. And you can see she has to do this for every figure. She's hand erased um, any, uh, any variability or overlap between these groups in order to produce a dimorphism that doesn't actually exist. Um, so I think, you know, what I find interesting here is that um, even when we uh, say that we care so much about stats and so much about doing it right, um, you know, when we are trying to suppose difference, those normal distributions are super sneaky, man. Like, turns out they overlap quite a bit because distributions are big. Um, so I'll give you uh, another example, and this is from Janet Hyde's work on a paper called the Gender Similarities, Pro um, the Gender Similarities Hypothesis. So what Dr. Hyde did was look at um, uh, 46 meta-analyses in the psychological literature. And, um, she, and she looked to see what are the actual sex differences in the published record. As you might imagine, um, because of the way uh, because of the bias in the scientific record where we are more likely to produce results that find statistical difference, more on that later in the talk, um, you know, the majority of the research on cognitive sex differences and neuroscience contend that every single thing we study has some kind of demonstrable sex difference. So um, I'm showing you an image here of a 0.21 effect size, which is considered a small effect size. Um, so it's known to not be super big, but also it is statistically significant and in fact, um, an effect size that's quite common in the literature. And so you can see when you actually represent the normal distribution of a difference between two categories with a 0.21 effect size, these are almost fully overlapping distributions, right? So here's what Dr. Hyde found. The striking result of her analysis of these meta, of these meta analyses is that 30% of the effect sizes in the sex difference literature are in the close to zero range, 
and an additional 48% are in the small range, like I'm showing you here. Therefore, the majority of research papers in this analysis that purported a sex difference, 78% of them had results that look like this figure or worse. And all of them, of course, were contending in their abstracts and their results and their interpretation that this is a meaningful sex difference. Um, issues of categories and binaries show up not just in human subjects research, but in animal subjects and animal models. Another hotly contested issue is that of whether the estrus cycle is meaningful in animal studies research. So the estrus cycle is like the menstrual cycle. Um, I have collaborated with people who uh, say that females are just too hard to study. Um, and sometimes it's because behaviorally they've decided they are too hard. Sometimes it's because they don't like having to control for the, the um, estrus cycle variation. Um, and I think it's worth asking the, what assumptions about gender from how we understand humans get into how we think about sex in, in animals. So there's this sort of sex as a biological variation debate happening where some people are arguing it's because of estrus cycles that we should be studying females. And then there's a, another part of it saying, we actually think that the estrus cycle has no impact, which is why we should study females. And there's a, it's, it's an interesting, um, uh, it, I feel like they're just talking at different levels of analysis. I actually think both, both positions are correct. Um, I think it just is, is, is variable dependent. Um, I, the other thing that is important to notice here is that um, when it comes to the estrus cycle, um, the amount of hormonal variation in an estrus or menstrual cycle is not any more than the diurnal variation of testosterone. So testosterone varies as much or more in a 24 hour period as estrogen or progesterone does over 28, 35, 40 days. Um, so again, when we're worried about controlling for variability, when we contend something's too hard to control for, um, it's interesting that one type of variability is considered too hard and another type is perfectly acceptable. So questions we can ask about categories and binaries. What cultural and linguistic framework do your categories come from? Does your research question assume the categories exist? Does it assume that they are distinct? Does your research reinforce categories? In what ways can you explore not just statistical meaning, but scientific meaning when you compare categories? And do you find yourself having to do any mental gymnastics to make your sense of difference uh, between groups fit the data? Our last point um, of these three problems, generalizable for who, is um, our way of starting to pose, why is it that um, there's one type of body <laughs> that we think is generalizable for everybody, rather than imagining we might learn from other types of bodies. So I want to give you one example. This you, this, you are not intended to be able to read this slide. This is to be, this is to demonstrate a body of literature, not uh, because you should be able to read the text. Um, this table contains every case study of transgender people with rheumatic disease in the literature as of July 2022. This is a July 2022 publication, a table from it. There are 20, not 20 studies, 20 people. And this is the study, this is because that um, clinicians started to observe that transgender people, especially transgender women on, ge on gender affirming hormones were in some cases developing autoimmune disease after exposure to those exogenous hormones. Um, what this tells me is that there's actually a lot we can learn from the study of transgender people that the, that um, understanding what it is, what the understanding downstream impacts of exogenous hormones um, could be incredibly useful and then reapply back into our study of hormonal contraception, hormone replacement therapy, uh, testosterone therapy, many different types of therapies that happen in the bodies that are so much more frequently studied in the scientific literature. One other example I wanted to give is that um, another issue that we've observed, and this is from um, a collaboration I have with uh, Dr. Brendan Harley, and this is a figure produced by Dr. Samantha Zambudo, who is uh, one of the main, she just recently graduated, but one of the main students who's been working on this project, is that we, um, you know, I do some applied work that looks at tissue engineering models of the endometrium. And in that work, we have sort of the same donor cells and tissues that we use that are the same as what all the other labs use. So like everyone uses Ishikawa cells, everyone uses Huvex, um, every, everyone uses the same cell lines in order to produce these tissue models, um, especially if those tissues or those cells have a reputation for being easy to culture in the lab. Um, even tissue banks where you can potentially get 
um, a slightly more variability in who the donor might be. Um, in our preliminary research so far, so far suggests that most of these tissues and cells derive from white patients. Uh, and usually patients, usually adult patients in their 30s, as far as we can tell, for the most part. Um, so what this means is that tissue model, tissue engineering research is basic research that is applied into the health sciences and often used in clinical studies um, and is intended to be generalizable, right? We create these models so that we can understand the system, so that we can develop therapies to help with endometriosis, fibroids, infertility, and more. But if we're only basing it off of the same cell line, what does that mean in terms of how we might be missing a lot of human variability? Um, these cell lines are coming from people with one particular set of lived experiences, right? And we know that lived experiences get into the body in all sorts of meaningful ways. So, under, so measuring more variability um, and introducing that variability into um, model systems research is also important to consider. So three questions to consider about generalizability. Who exists within the norm? And who is the comparison? Remember when Dr. Davis brought this up earlier that, um, you know, why is it that certain groups are only important or valid if they are in compar compared to whoever we view as the norm? Why are some populations able to be generalized from and others not? And what kinds of relevant information are we losing from our studies when we are not clear about the samples from which our generalizable data come from? And here I pass it off to Dr. Davis. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think uh, we wanted to think about what some of the interventions or at least frameworks for thinking about interventions would be. Um, and to, um, you know, as these examples have shown, there are all sorts of conscious and unconscious um, ideological frameworks and assumptions that go into the building of research projects, into the analysis, into the um, distribution and uptake. And so um, one of the, the things that we practice is being upfront with the kinds of um, ideological frameworks that we operate from and recognizing the kind of um, positions and theoretical frameworks that we use. Um, so here we are really interested in thinking about what some queer and feminist interventions might be in this question. Um, and so, you know, feminist intervention would is one that says that all people, all genders, all ages, all abilities are equally valuable, equally important, and all equally have something to contribute. Um, so research that is um, exclusionary to some groups that prioritize some groups over others, right, are, are some that we want to, it's an assumption that we want to challenge kind of inherently. Um, we think that research should equally account for the realities of all genders um, and that men and maleness are not an unmarked default um, and are not inherently generalizable to other genders, um, and especially not any more than other genders are generalizable to men, right? So um, thinking about that concept. And then from the uh, queer and queer feminist interventions, um, we believe that um, that which is deemed other or abnormal, outlier, or the opposite of ideal, um, so in other words, queer, is inherently valuable. Um, so we want to recognize and reject the stigma and minoritization of what falls outside of normal or average, and the assumption that average equals morally correct, healthy, or better, um, or, in health, or inherently more valuable. Um, so we are interested in frameworks that, uh, that center and, and celebrate heterogeneity over homogeneity. Um, and also we wanna ar argue that rigorous research is research that accounts for and covers everyone. So slide. Um, so we have a couple of framings of thinking about, you know, we have uh, thrown out some categories and approaches that um, we want to be thinking carefully and thoughtfully with. So one of the questions here would be, if not average or normal or ideal, then what? Um, what do we, where do we go from there? Um, and so here we want an, an emphasis on multiplicity and variation um, on uh, um, features and qualities and aspects as things distributed across populations um, at, at different rates, right, rather than existing all in the same uh, composite kind of average or ideal. And then, all right. Um, and if not binaries or pre-constructed categories, then what? Um, so this is a place where we want to recognize that 
Um, when there is overlap and sameness, if that's significant, right? So seeking out difference, seeking out, um, again, dimorphism or outliers or, or assuming them from the get-go and having that also be the kind of result that is the most likely to be um, the most likely to be published and distributed um, projects that are looking for difference being the most likely to be funded, right, are actually shaping a narrative that overemphasize difference without recognizing and acknowledging sameness. And that has real impact for things like assumptions of generalizability or the lack thereof across communities. Um, and is there another... Oh, yeah. So um, we also want to acknowledge that all of the taxonomies and the categories that we're talking about are cultural, right? That these are not universally shared across all um, ways that uh, humans and human cultures and languages uh, carve up and organize the world. And in fact, um, even scientific practices and labs don't all do this in the same way. And so we want people to be very clear about what are the categories they're using? How do they define them? Um, and how they come to those approaches as a way of kind of denaturalizing an assumption that we all mean the same thing or that everyone comes to our research uh, in the same ways. This is also really important when we think about pluralizing science and recognizing um, other modes of science in particular things like indigenous sciences um, and also other frameworks, right? And other categorical taxonomies. Um, and we also want to uh, be really clear that we're not saying that things like um, binaries or categories are irrelevant or that we should never use them. Of course, they are meaningful within the societies and to the people that we're talking about um, and that are the subjects and the recipients of our research. Um, so we're not saying never, never categories and bina binaries are never relevant, um, but just to be really uh, explicit and, and conscious within our own selves of how and when we're using them, what we mean by them, um, and acknowledging that um, when we use them, we're also um, defining them and reproducing them in our own use of those uh, categories and those terminologies. Um, and that it's also really important to delineate between the effects of structural categories um, uh, as a phenomena um, versus having them be presented as inherent or biological. And so here we have a parallel too with the ways that race operates in the world. Um, so biological race, right, is a, a myth. It's a, a cultural myth, um, but the realities of people who are racialized within a structural system that assumes race are real. Um, so much in the same way that people experience a world that assumes gender and organizes the world around gender, often binary gender, um, the effects and the lived experiences as they relate to gender are are absolutely significant. And so we would never want to throw out that as a thing that we consider. In fact, we want in many ways um, to bring that to the front and be able to consider those dynamics, particularly um, both in terms of lived experience and health outcomes, but also in things like gender inequality, right? Um, those are all connected things. So um, being very clear that when we're talking about the difference between gender as a kind of um, inherent biological, um, automatically uh, binary kind of a category or, or um, reality versus the experience of gender for people throughout the world. Is that my... Um, and so the other thing that we want to think about in terms of how do we do this work, how do we continue to ask these questions, is thinking about how we as scholars and researchers um, expand and, and have a capacious practice in what we do. Um, and so part of the question here that I think is also very core to a queer feminist framework is um, what does it mean for science and medicine not to account for all of human variation, right? Um, what does it mean for studies to um, consistently and kind of as a majority practice to exclude um, all, all sorts of swaths of, of humans and in ways that um, are not challenged again by those funders who are, or um, publication venues or, or those things also in our, our classrooms and teaching. Um, so what would it look like for research to account for outliers um, and how do we start to have conversations like in the example um, that uh, Dr. Clancy mentioned, how do we start to have conversations that think about 
uh, frameworks and research which account for outliers as research with which inherently accounts for everyone, right? As accounting for the whole and being relevant, um, not just as the kind of comparative other, but actually as things that are relevant to whole populations, um, uh, both because it accounts for the, the margins, right, um, as well as the center, but also because of the ways that um, when we acknowledge that that overlap and sameness is actually probably the majority of the context we're talking about, um, then the um, significance of that being in that those outlying categories may not be as significant as suggested. And so one of the things that we want to argue for is the role of collaborative approaches and interdisciplinarity, um, not just, uh, you know, as a thing that is an example of our own collaboration, um, but reading and thinking and learning um, from folks beyond our own fields and subfields can be a, um, a pretty essential process. Um, one of the things that allows us to do is think and, and um, be formulating our responses outside of the kind of echo chambers that can be formed within our own fields, the ways that our fields can be um, hold up a kind of exceptionalism. Um, so if we are only reading the things within our own field or subfield and not reading things outside of them, um, first of all, there are lots of ways that the conversations in other fields um, are exactly the same or relevant, um, but also when we're thinking about um, histories and practices, right, some of the really important work that we might need to know in order to think about the history and the ethics of what we're doing um, are going to be conducted by folks in other fields. So um, people talking about research ethics or the histories of things maybe in something like a history of science and medicine rather than biological science, right, or anthropology. Um, so thinking and reading outside of our own fields in order to better understand histories and practices. Um, I think the other thing that's really key here um, for those of us who are operating in predominantly white, predominantly male fields is that um, when we're reading only within our own field or fields, um, and those fields are predominantly white and male, um, that just serves to kind of reproduce those biases in the field um, to the exclusion of women and non-binary and um, Black, Indigenous, and, and people of color. So um, reading beyond the field is also a way of getting outside of the um, demographics, current demographics that we are in fact trying to undo within the field. Um, so as I said, many of the conversations about ethics, methods, and best practices both overlap and are relevant across a, a number of fields um, and not just not only specific to the particular subfields that we work within. Um, and so we can look to how to have a better, more ethical, uh, more inclusive practices across a number of um, arenas and ways of thinking and not just within our own um, and also understanding what the outcomes, the implications, and the impact are of our research. Um, again, those are things that may be considered or the sorts, um, context of conversation for the fields um, that are really thinking about those histories and about those outcomes and in impacts, which may not be the focus in our fields um, themselves. And then really uh, just a, a pitch and a call for the engagement with theory, with other modes of knowing, including things like ethnography and even realms like fiction where people are um, really robustly and um, import importantly, um, critically engaging with the topics, the methods, the um, ethics and the outcomes of the research that we do in ways that invite us into better practice, invite us into conversation with folks um, who may not already be in the rooms we're in um, and invite us to uh, always be asking the kinds of questions rather than assuming that we already know the answers. Um, and so this is just an example of reading beyond and outside um, of ways that the things that we've talked about today are echoed within um, those who are thinking about data science um, and data ethics. So these are two points from the Feminist Data Manifest No, um, which is a, a wonderful text if you haven't already read it. Um, so two of the points that they offer are um, point 29, we refuse data logics that hypervalue the quantitative, the objective, and the generalizable. We commit instead to developing, adopting, and advancing methodologies that draw insight from the subjective, embodied, contingent, political, and effective in ways that transcend traditional boundaries between qualitative and quantitative. 
Um, and number 32 is we refuse reductionist practices that view people as data points in order to embrace the whole person. We commit to the re requirement of recognizing personhood as a feminist data value. Um, so again, uh, I think the, the questions we're asking are, are questions that are part of a number of conversation across such a wide variety of fields, um, and that we are, uh, our research and our perspectives are absolutely strengthened um, by reading and engaging with these kinds of perspectives, not in an extractive way, but in a way that just brings us into better practice. Um, and this is a perfect transition to the last final examples I want to provide to just two <clears throat> um, to help us think about how can we how can we be radical scientists? How can we imagine a different future for science um, that fit that that tries to operate outside of the current incentive structures around being first, um, you know, <laughs> finding difference, generalizability normality how can we move outside of that so just just two examples <clears throat> the first one of course sorry from my lab um one of you know as i i mentioned um with the menstrual cycle example at the beginning something we've been really troubled by is that you know if you average all of our participants sure when you average everybody together you can look like that textbook menstrual cycle but because we when we look at any individual there's no, you know, there's like very few uh, variables along that composite that actually look like they could fit within those norms. We started to ask, are there other statistical ways that we could explore and imagine normality differently? And are there ways that we can actually contest the idea that there's such a thing as a normal at all? And so we use geometric morphometrics, which some of you may, may be familiar with the statistical method. It simply just means um, that we are tr we've come, we're using a method. It's actually mostly used on bones. So you 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 mention you find certain landmarks on the bone, and then you look at shape differences. So it allows you to, for instance, notice that two hip bones. <clears throat> sorry, I need to take a sip of water. Um, it allows us to notice that, say, two hip bones from a five foot tall person and a six foot tall person both come from humans. Um, while noticing the shape difference of, you know, a gorilla hip bone and a human hip bone, which might be similar sizes, but are very different shapes. So it's an emphasis on shape over amplitude. And something that happens in, in menstrual cycle hormone research is that those amplitudes, that really high estrogen peak at the middle, and that really big lump of progesterone, <clears throat> um, sort of crowd out all the other variation you might imagine. So when we use geometric morphometrics, we actually find in our sample of 100 <laughs> that there are six meet like biologically meaningful groups that sort themselves when we look at um, landmarks of beginning, end, and middle of the cycle. And then we scale the hormones and we scale the width of the menstrual cycle so that we can just pay attention to shape. And you can see among these different groups, we've got sort of um, sorry, my cursor needs to be down here. I also wanted to represent all of the people working on this project because, you know, science is not, <laughs> I, I have run exactly zero of these analyses. Um, in fact, it's all the people down here who've been running them. So you can see, um, this is the unscaled data above, and then this is the scale data. So you can share, see the shapes better below. You can see we've got, um, you know, this estrogen peak that can be much wider or sharper in some individuals. You can see the progesterone. Um, the shape of the progesterone, we even have, again, this like two peak appearance in group three, and we also have almost kind of a two peak, but a different two peak appearance in group six. The capabilities of the menstrual cycle, these are all ovulatory people. These are all ovulatory cycles, I should say. So the capabilities of the menstrual cycle to look incredibly different and still operate within the original intention of the term normal is actually quite high. The last example I want to give is in thinking about null results. So again, something that we mentioned earlier in the talk is this idea that um, null results are not incentivized. And the incentive structures, the ways people have tried to address the problem of that null results don't get written up are to try to incentivize it within existing structures. So we'll create a journal. <laughs> we'll create um, money that we'll give you if you publish it. Like trying to operate a, a, within those incentive structures, and those haven't worked. What has been really effective has been bringing in reflexive practices, qualitative ethnographic practices, and actually interviewing and talking to and getting to know the scientists who do this work. So I just want to give one lovely example of this, Rebecca Jordan Young's book, Brainstorm, where um, she, you know, so, you know, we talked about neuroscience 
discussed this earlier with Dr. Joel's work, Dr. Jordan Young interviewed, I think, over 100 neuroscientists. And over the course of months and months of meeting with them, hanging out with them in their labs, interviewing them, um, they eventually all admitted they all have a, you know, a virtual or real file drawer um, of all their null results, and that those null results are actually more than the significant results that they publish in the literature. So part of the reason that sex differences are perceived in neuroscience is because of the fact that the majority of the results are never published, because those are the ones that are not going to get, are not going to support people within the existing incentive structures of science. So again, it was what it took was not, you know, let's create a journal of null results. What it took was, um, you know, a scholar with ethnographic and reflexive expertise to come in and actually sort of dig apart and pull apart that type of meaning. So uh, those are the two examples I wanted to give, and I, and um, and we're going to end there for time. And uh, I just wanted to give you a couple of other resources um, that, if any of you are interested in continuing to read and think about this stuff, these are just a couple that we like. Thank you.